السلام علیکم خواتین حضرات وسیم ایس اینڈ ویلکم سی یو ٹو لیکچر نمبر ٹوئنٹی سکس آف مارکیٹنگ فار نان پرافٹس ایم کے ٹی سکس ٹو ایٹ ایٹ دا ورچوئل یونیورسٹی آف پاکستان دی ماڈیول آف لرننگ از گوئنگ ٹو بی دی کمپوننٹس آف اے چینل اسٹریٹجی بٹ وی آل نو دیٹ وی نیڈ ٹو ہیو چینلس ویئر بائی وی کین ریچ اوور ٹارگیٹ آڈینس اینڈ مارکیٹرس آلویز نیڈ چینلس اور پلیسز ویئر دے کین ٹرانسیکٹ اینڈ سیل their programs or products to their target audiences. So in other words, we can say that marketers need channels because they want to reach their target audiences and target audiences need channels because they want to reach offerings. And there has to be a place where this transaction takes place. Uh, what is going to be the place and uh, what are going to be the variables and dynamics that allow an organization to decide who are going to be the members of the channel or channels they're going to use is going to be the very topic of this module. And uh, we also know that uh, it basically is uh, a function of uh, what the product looks like or uh, what are the features of the program and its uh, associated uh, uh, variables that uh, are make it important for us uh, a particular channel that we choose. In other words, whether we are going to have distributors who are going to distribute our product or we're we going to uh, confine to the, our uh, the one location facility which is going to be everything uh, rolled into one. The meaning uh, that is going to be the facility from where we sell our programs or try to influence the behavior of our target audience and that is going to be the channel. So in this particular case, we can be very clear about this particular factor that the channel is not broad, it is not deep, it is just the facility where we offer the product. So in other words, in case we want to expand the channel or extend the outreach, we have to replicate a similar model of the facility that we have as the original one. Um, for example, if we are running a dispensary or hospital and we want to extend the channel, we have to have more dispensaries or hospitals, which again is a function of so many different variables. Uh, for example, do we really have the human resource or the financial resources to back it up and uh, to be able to put up another facility or facilities? Um, these are the questions that have to be addressed before we take uh, a decision on the uh, channel channel extension uh, because uh, we have to be very clear about uh, whether we are going to get uh, a similar kind of human resource that is engaged uh, at our original facility and uh, whether we are going to have uh, systems and procedures installed uh, the very way they are working at our original facility and uh, whether implementation of the program is going to be uh, folding out in exactly the same way it uh, does at our original facility. So it is a function of so many different variables, but one important factor that we have to keep in mind is um, with this uh, kind of a setup, that we have total control of the organization because we're not dealing with intermediaries. And uh, everything that takes place, it takes place within the premises of our organization and which happens to be the place and place is the main variable which uh, defines uh, the existence of a channel because that is where uh, transactions take place. Um, let us talk about uh, the one more example which I think I already have talked about. Uh, if you are uh, distributing a healthcare product like uh, the ORS, then the channels of distribution are going to be very different from the one I've just talked about. The one I talked about. Uh, fits very well into a typical non-profit setup. Um, and the one I'm going to talk about here also fits uh, into a non-profit setup that is dealing with a product that has the similarities of a convenience item. Now, this is something that uh, we all have learned from our basic marketing course, that uh, there is a classification of um, uh, products offered on the market and uh, convenience goods or items are the ones uh, which people buy at their convenience. So in other words, if we are dealing with that kind of a product and uh, it happened to be a non-profit organization, 
we have to follow a similar kind of a channel setup that uh, we deal with while we are selling commercial items. And it is precisely for that particular reason that um, many nonprofits dealing in uh, health care products do involve commercial intermediaries. And uh, the setup uh, is uh, just like uh, any uh, channels of distribution for a convenience uh, commercial item. Here, we have to answer one particular question uh, while we discuss uh, the why and when do we really need channels and what should be the form and shape of those channels. And here uh, I'm going to talk about the components of a channel strategy. There basically are two important components. The one is direct versus indirect channels and the other one is the length and breadth of a channel. What is meant by direct and indirect channels is going to be the topic of discussion to begin with. Uh, I think that we all are convinced about one particular fact that uh, any organization, may that be on the commercial side or on the nonprofit side, would like to deal with its target audiences directly because there are so many different benefits and advantages that you derive out of interacting with your uh, target audiences directly. But that does not happen to be the case always because at times we are dealing with products that have to be available um, on a very wide scale all over the country, for example. And uh, then you see that there are uh, products and services or programs that happen to be very much concentrated at the one particular facility. So what really are the benefits that uh, the drive or may drive an organization uh, to uh, have a direct channel are that uh, the organizations can have total control of the channel uh, by not involving any intermediaries. And when they have total control, there is no dilution of that control because there is no interference uh, by any other stakeholders or uh, the business partners. Organizations can also have the benefit of not sharing so many different things with the other parties, like profits, for example. They do not really have to share efforts on brand building and their reputation. And by the same token, they do not really divide attention of the media. The media can pay total attention with a lot of focus on the organization instead of the other stakeholders at the same time. So you can see there are so many different advantages Another one is uh, direct interaction where the target audiences uh, uh, gives the organizations a very good focus on specific uh, needs of uh, the target audiences and uh, they can respond to the uh, needs uh, very quickly and uh, with much more precision. So in other words, the strategies that organizations may have to come up with uh, in response to the different factors that uh, we have learned so far, they can be uh, much more agile and quick in putting together all the, all the uh, strategic formulations uh, to uh, make the programs more effective. Now, given all these benefits, it would seem that uh, any organization should go for a direct uh, interaction or uh, a direct contact with their target audience and uh, thereby have a channel with which allows them the benefits of this kind of a directness. But again, that generally is not the case because there are a couple of strategic considerations that have to be given weight before decision on channels is taken. As a matter of fact, it brings us back to the scarcity of resources on the human side as well as on the financial side that make it important for organizations to involve independent parties who are willing to act as their uh, the channel members. I would go on to say that uh, it is not just the uh, limitation of such resources uh, which uh, dictate uh, uh, involving uh, other uh, the members in order to make uh, the whole setup more efficient and effective. It also is uh, the other considerations like uh, if the organization happens to be uh, just a one product company, uh, why the organization should go for an independent channel because it will become very costly for the organization. And in that particular case, the organization can always count on services offered by commercial intermediaries. 
And uh, that happens to be the case with uh, so many different um, healthcare products. And let us talk about uh, the example of ORS all over again. Uh, you will agree with me that uh, the being a convenience item, it has to be distributed at a very, very broad level, thereby uh, making it important for the nonprofit organization to get in touch with uh, commercial intermediaries. Uh, because by doing that, organizations can cut uh, on their capital costs. They are dealing with the parties that already specialize in their particular area and they are distributing uh, commercial items um, uh, from uh, so many different manufacturers. And if we uh, get into some kind of arrangement with them, we add one more product to their um, uh, distribution resource, thereby making it uh, more uh, effective. We make it effective because it offers them a better scope of distribution. It offers them better economies of scale. Here you see the question comes, um, how should you get to pick up your distributor? Well, in that case, you have to look into things like how many products and services the distributor is already distributing. If you think he's encumbered with um, products that uh, already are uh, part of the uh, supply chain and uh, the distributor already has a lot on their plate, then you may really not consider that kind of a party and go to somebody else. But the fact remains that we have to be dealing with a party that has a much bigger scope of distribution and they keep you from incurring capital costs on your own project. And this is something which nonprofit organizations should avoid because they can utilize those funds elsewhere. And they can utilize those funds more effectively and I will give you the one example from um, Indonesia, where uh, a few nonprofits dealing in uh, healthcare products wanted to have their own uh, distribution networks and did put up their own networks. And uh, the result was that uh, they could curtail the death rate in terms of uh, infant mortality by offering. ORS and uh, related products again, all over the country, but then the costs they had to incur they were really sky high. And uh, the argument goes, as the literature reveals, that um, those nonprofit organizations you know, they could have utilized or diverted you know, those funds to um, other areas like you know, the advertising, for example. If they had engaged um, the commercial intermediaries you know, who you know, were into similar products, and uh, they could utilize their services instead of uh, investing so much into the capital cost. They could have uh, diverted those funds toward advertising and may have uh, attained higher results in terms of uh, the child the mortality. In other words, by cutting the number further of uh, uh, children deaths. So this is uh, the one example of uh, not getting into uh, your own channels if you happen to be a nonprofit organization and if you are uh, distributing a product like a basic healthcare. Then there are examples of uh, the other services. For example, uh, childcare services, just the one I talked about. Um, away from the ORS, this example is not about ORS, but rather about other services uh, and um, the services which may involve so many different places all over the place. And when I say all over the place, what I mean is one particular widespread geographical area. Uh, just suppose that uh, the nonprofit organization is going to uh, distribute its program or the benefits of its uh, program uh, all over the country. Uh, what is going to be the situation like? Do you think the nonprofit is going to be in a position to incur capital costs having diff different places where um, organizational members can interact with their target audiences? The answer seems to be um, a no, because um, they will be needing so many different buildings and uh, the places where they interact with their target audiences. And therefore, they need to join hands with uh, such places that may be sympathetic toward their cause and that may become um, 
reliable partners in distributing that particular cause. And uh, the fact is that in many countries of the world, um, for child health care, facilities like uh, public schools and uh, community health centers are the kind of places that are used for distribution of programs. So in this uh, the particular case, you need to have uh, the channel partners who are not commercial intermediaries, but happen to be uh, different entities like schools and uh, the healthcare centers. These examples and considerations that I just talked about uh, give us a lot of insight into deciding whether we should go for a direct channel or an indirect channel. Here, an indirect channel sounds rather more favorable, but the answer does not lie in going for an indirect channel because we are dealing with partners and partners can be very helpful. The answer really lies in looking into the efficiency and effectiveness of the distribution system. So in other words, we just cannot say that a particular program or a product looks like a commercial item and therefore we should go for commercial distribution or a program looks like uh, you know, a hospital or a dispensary kind of a thing and therefore we should have direct channels. No, we have to look into how efficient a particular channel can be and how effective it really could be. So here the question arises, what uh, do we really mean by efficiency and effectiveness? Efficiency basically refers to the performance of the one particular system, meaning what the system gives us back in terms of performance by involving the least possible costs on the financial, human and systems side. I think it is a very concise kind of a definition of efficiency. So in other words, what I'm saying is that we have to incur the least possible resources and get the maximum output by deploying those resources. And effectiveness basically is maximization of that particular performance at that given level of resources. So in other words, if we are producing the 100 units by employing resources which amount to uh, 50 uh, and uh, we are in a position to go beyond the 100 by maintaining the resource level at 50 we can say that we are more efficient and we are also more effective because we are maximizing our output however if output declines and we are achieving less than 100 we are neither efficient nor effective and therefore we need to have the certain benchmarks in terms of uh, what is uh, meant by a, a least uh, possible level of resources and uh, what could be the optimal level of uh, uh, production. Uh, whether we are producing uh, in a manufacturing concern or we are producing services or we are distributing uh, any kind of uh, the benefits uh, by offering a program, we would need to be in a position to define uh, what is the optimal level that we are dealing with and uh, what could be the least possible resources. So depending on the level of efficiency and effectiveness, we decide whether we should go for a direct channel or an indirect channel. The answer does not lie in uh, looking at things by experience. That uh, is the bottom line. Now, coming to the next component, which is about the length and breadth of uh, the channels, this basically is an extension of what I've talked about so far. Uh, length basically is uh, the number of tiers that are involved with the, between the uh, organization that is uh, the selling or distributing its program and the ultimate consumer or the ultimate client in our nonprofit terminology. The ultimate target audience uh, the, that uh, the benefits from uh, the execution of uh, our programs. And um, breadth of uh, a channel uh, the basically is uh, the number of places where we put our programs or put our product for sale or put our services for sale. And on the commercial side, the equivalent of that is uh, different retail stores, then the wholesalers and so on and so forth. In other words, we can say that uh, it is the number of places that defines the, the breadth of uh, the channel. In other words, uh, all those places where we are selling our product, our service or uh, distributing our program. If we talk about a hospital or a dispensary like I uh, talked about this earlier, 
that we do not really have a channel which is very broad. At the same time, it is not very deep. However, if uh, there's a chain of dispensaries uh, or uh, something uh, like ED, for example, um, we really have a very broad channel where we need to have uh, the very effective uh, the monitoring and control of uh, the, all those channel members uh, who are operating all over the country. And uh, I would say again uh, that we have to go back to the concept of uh, the level of efficiency and effectiveness, uh, deciding on uh, how many more um, outlets uh, we can have where uh, we uh, dispense with uh, the uh, benefits of our services uh, that depends basically on how efficient we can be given a certain level of resource that we have to ourselves, meaning human resources, the financial resources, and organizational resources in terms of putting together uh, for implementation all the systems and procedures that uh, basically are the hallmark of uh, a successful organizational uh, setup. Then there are examples of uh, those hospitals and libraries that happen to be very central. In other words, they do not really have uh, too many outlets uh, of similar nature. For example, if we take a look at Shaukat Khanum, it happens to be just one big effective hospital. They are in the process of putting up more hospitals, but for the time being, uh, the one central place happens to be the point of distribution. They have extended into diagnostics and um, uh, they have done that by way of extending their original brand into diagnostics. And uh, I. Uh, I am quite confident that we all understand what brand extension is and it is by virtue of that extension that they are having so many different diagnostic centers where anyone can walk in to have certain tests run on him or her. The point here is there are central places where people do not mind going and do not question why don't they have the more centers like that? And even if they do, they still prefer to go there because they know it is a place which is highly efficient and highly effective. And the Shaukat Khanum is the one particular example of that particular scenario. Uh, let us talk about another example of SIUT, Sin Institute of Urology and Transplantation. They have more than one center. And uh, over the last, uh, you know, so many decades uh, of their existence, they have done an excellent job of okay, having uh, these okay, the centers okay, where they um, ad distribute the benefits of their program. My point here is, if okay, you have the resources, uh, the ones I enumerated in terms of uh, the human excellence, uh, the financial muscle, and uh, the systems and procedural um, strength, then okay, you have. Uh, all the reasons to go for extension um, of uh, your original facility at uh, different places so that uh, you can distribute your program uh, by being close to the target audiences. The concept of distribution still remains the same. Here, I would like to draw your attention toward the breadth part of uh, the component. I have talked about the length or uh, the depth of uh, distribution channel and uh, we have seen that it is basically defined by uh, the two or three different tiers like uh, the distributor, wholesalers and retailers. Uh, I would talk about this particular uh, factor a little more in detail um, in a while but uh, so much for the depth of uh, the channel. And uh, talking about the breadth, we have to take a look at the size of the market. So in other words, it is the market size which defines the breadth of the channel. And I am sure that you are with me when I'm talking about the size of the market, and I would say that the example of ORS is a really classic example of uh, making us understand what really is meant by the breadth. The size of the market is big. As a nonprofit organization, you're trying to reach your target audiences anywhere everywhere in the country. And you have to make sure that uh, babies that they do not really get into an accidental death only because the mothers are not really careful about uh, administering the uh, oral rehydration solution. And uh, therefore, you've got to make it available uh, at their convenience, meaning it should be available everywhere and anywhere, where they can walk at their convenience 
and find that particular product. So this is what is really meant by the market size and market size being the basic factor of defining what the breadth of the market is. And once we are clear about the breadth of the market, then we can get in things like what should be the length of the channel. Here you see the breadth and length are uh, interacted and uh, we decide that whether we are going to have companies own representation in uh, the major cities and town centers or we're going to have distributors. If we have distributors, how are they going to manage uh, further the members of their trade? Okay, for example, uh, with how many wholesalers they should be dealing with and those wholesalers in turn dealing with retailers who will be selling that particular product. So this you know, has taken us back to the concept of uh, the commercial uh, marketing and commercial intermediaries. And uh, needless to say that uh, we are uh, here operating as um, a partner to a commercial intermediary in order to make our product available anywhere and everywhere. So therefore, we can uh, easily uh, draw a parallel here um, between the uh, concept of um, product classification uh, as uh, we know it from the commercial side uh, with uh, the non-profit side. So in other words, uh, we can borrow the concept and implement that or um, you know, execute it uh, in its essence on the non-profit sector side as well. But before that, we've got to take a look at the classification of goods as we have learned as a part of another course. We know that goods are classified as convenience goods, as shopping goods, and as specialty goods. Now, convenience goods are the ones for which your target audience does not really make an effort to go far off to find that particular product. They expect that the product has got to be available around the corner. For example, cigarettes or candies or chocolates and so on and so forth. Uh, by the same token, if you are dealing with uh, the healthcare products, you've got to uh, treat those products as convenience goods. And uh, once you are clear about this particular concept, uh, you are going to be uh, right uh, on the effective and most efficient distribution setup. Uh, expanding the concept further, uh, we know that uh, shopping goods are those for which uh, the target audiences like to make certain comparisons. They like to evaluate the one product against the other. And for that, they may have to undertake a little bit of effort in order to uh, make sure that, uh, that they have taken the right decision. And uh, like I said, for that, they are willing to uh, the walk a mile, you know, so to say. And uh, they do not really uh, treat those products as convenience goods. And uh, if we think our nonprofit uh, organization fits into uh, that particular kind of a concept of classification of goods, then we've got to have a compatible kind of a distribution set up. I would say that um, basic healthcare units could fall into this particular category because people are not really concerned about how close it is, rather they are concerned about the quality it offers. And uh, if they think that the one uh, at a distance is uh, the more reliable, they would rather walk to that particular facility. And uh, that way, it happens to be defined as a shopping good. Talking about the third uh, uh, variety of um, the goods is the specialty goods. And I would say I already have talked about that by giving you examples kind of from uh, hospitals like uh, the Shaka Khanum and SIUT. Now, these are the kind of places which are highly, highly specialized in their pursuits. And whatever they do is something which is not available elsewhere. Since there are no substitutes to their programs, people are likely to undertake a very strong effort to get to those places and be treated there. So having a very clear understanding of the concept of classification of goods, we can decide the kind of distribution networks where we really belong or the kind of networks which we should have. Um, examples of convenience goods, shopping goods, and the specialty goods can make the whole thing uh, very 
uh, clear in terms of what should be more efficient and more effective uh, given our uh, level of resources. Let me take you to a couple of uh, slides in order to uh, further uh, dilate on the concept that I just talked about, meaning the component of uh, the distribution uh, length and breadth. As you can see from this particular side, we have the manufacturer or supplier or organization in the nonprofit context sitting right on top. And uh, the process of distribution starts from this particular level. This is the primary level. And as we can see on the left hand side, the first the box that you see is representative. Here we have a company representative or a distributor who is going to distribute our products. And I think the ORS product uh, should be a very good guide for us to go through this particular distribution setup. Uh, from uh, representative, we go down to the wholesaler. We need to have um, a few wholesalers in every market who are in a better position to sell at a wholesale basis to retailers who also can happen to be part of their market. The reason the product has to go down to the retailer, which is the uh, level before last, uh, because your product is a convenience good and it's got to be available anywhere and everywhere, having a very widespread outreach. It is the level of the desired outreach which defines this particular concept of uh, the distribution channel depth. Once the product is available at the retailers, it means uh, it has a widespread availability and outreach. And you as a consumer do not really have any problem finding that particular product because it is a convenience product and it is available around the corner. Let me draw your attention to the one more factor uh, while I talk about the depth of distribution because this is a model uh, which uh, basically has been drawn keeping in view the depth of distribution. But since the depth of distribution is contingent upon the breadth of distribution, we have to talk about both at the same time. So while clarifying that particular point, I would like to draw your attention to the arrow which is right off the box which contains this representative. Now this arrow flows directly from uh, manufacturer supplier and organization to the wholesaler. And if you go further right, you have an arrow flowing from the top level right down to the retailer. And if you go further right, you see that arrow flowing all the way down to the final consumer. Now, this uh, could be, uh, I would say, the simplification of uh, the depth of the channel because uh, we are uh, dealing with a market where we can afford to be direct with the consumer if we take the example of the rightmost arrow which flows from the primary level of this particular uh, graphics and flows right down to the final consumer. Um, if you go back to the left, you would realize one more channel has been added uh, by way of having retailers. And further back, you will see wholesalers getting into the picture. And further back, representatives getting into the picture by being either company representatives or distributors. So depending upon the breadth of the uh, channel, uh, we decide how much depth we need to have. So we can uh, summarize our understanding from the graphics that I went through, rather we all went through, uh, like the following. Uh, depth and breadth of distribution are interrelated. In other words, if uh, the uh, channel happens to be very broad, it took it also it should be a little long. Otherwise, you will have problems of the monitoring and control. You have to have intermediaries between yourselves and the final consumer because you are wanting to control a product which happens to be a convenience item. And therefore, uh, healthcare the products would fit very well in the, into this particular example. Uh, however, if distribution does not really happen to be very wide, it they may not be the very deep as well uh, because uh, we do not really need to have the kind of uh, monitoring and controls uh, that uh, we saw in case of uh, convenience goods. Here uh, we are talking about um, healthcare services, not healthcare 
products, healthcare services, uh, whereby we get into uh, some coordinated effort with the community centers, with the healthcare centers, and uh, with the primary or secondary schools, where we go and distribute our products the once in a while, or maybe around the year. The fact remains that the channel in this particular case that does not happen to be very wide and therefore it doesn't really have to be that much deep as well. Um, and then we also have learned that uh, we also have the possibility of dealing directly with the target audience and we do that when we are selling something which happens to be a specialty good kind of a thing. And um, given that specialization, uh, we are offering something uh, which does not really have uh, too many substitutes uh, by others as well as by ourselves because uh, it takes a lot many resources in order to have uh, a replication of that particular concept, uh, meaning the concept of the physical facility that you have, a hospital like I talked about. So. The whole thing boils down to yet another concept that we have learned, and that is the concept of efficiency and effectiveness. We take a look at the breadth and depth of distribution channels by also making sure that whatever channel we have has got to be the most efficient and most effective. At this particular juncture, I feel the need of talking about the concept of integration. And I suppose with a lot of confidence that we all are knowledgeable about that particular concept uh, when we talk of uh, vertical integration, which uh, is uh, either a backward integration or forward integration. It is also known as uh, uh, upstream and the downstream, uh, the concept of uh, the integration. When you go back, if you happen to be a manufacturer or an organization and you go back uh, to deal with uh, your suppliers and uh, they like to deal uh, with yourselves, the by taking control of for the channel backwards, you integrate yourself backwards. If you uh, like to uh, own things uh, by way of uh, having your own supply chain uh, from your organization downwards, and when you are distributing a certain product, you are talking about the downstream or forward integration. So we are not to be confused about all these terminologies. The backward integration is upstream and forward integration is downstream. As long as we are clear about these two concepts, we are all done with what integration is all about. We know that we like to integrate channels because we want to have the better control of what is happening either upstream or downstream. Talking of uh, an example uh, from a hospital uh, that uh, may like to uh, own a wholesaler setup of uh, the medicines and uh, all related supplies that come to the hospital is a wonderful example of upstream integration or backward integration. The hospital is going backward or upstream in order to integrate that particular level of the supply chain. So in other words, it doesn't really have to deal with um, commercial wholesalers sitting in the marketplace uh, buying uh, different requirements for its hospital, whether it is just one facility or it happens to be a chain of facilities. The supply chain basically is owned by the hospital and that is what you call integration. And don't forget the fact that integration basically is carried out to have better controls and to assure quality. You assure quality of products when you are going to own one particular level of the channel. Now, if I give you another example of the downstream distribution, that could be an organization having certain stakes with its distributor in the marketplace. Now, the reason I'm talking about certain stakes because in a case of nonprofits, not many nonprofits own um, or rather uh, integrate uh, uh, forwardly or downstream uh, because uh, of the nature of their products in most of the cases. And uh, I would draw your attention to the fact that uh, even if uh, nonprofit organizations can afford to have 
their uh, the own uh, the distribution setup, uh, they should not really jump to it uh, before committing a very high level of capital cost uh, because they can have uh, access to uh, commercial intermediaries who already exist in the market and uh, benefit from their services and expertise. Therefore, I talked about uh, uh, a certain level of stakes that a nonprofit organization could, may have um, in uh, a distribution setup. The reason the organization could, would have stakes in that setup because uh, it is convinced that it needs to have uh, the better monitoring and control of whatever is being distributed at the distributor's level. And uh, the organization, it goes without saying, has to be a resourceful organization in order to undertake this kind of a venture. But the fact remains that uh, this is an example of downstream or forward integration. So uh, you get into the concept of integration only when uh, you think that uh, it is going to be more profitable to the organization and given the basic character of a nonprofit organization, we have to have all profits put into our reserves so that we can invest the same into future projects or existing programs in order to make them more efficient and more effective. Let me show you a graphical representation of this particular concept to make it more clear. As you can see from this particular slide, we are starting backwards or rather upwards or upstream, all terminologies denoting the same concept. And uh, this is the rightmost box. And uh, from there, uh, we uh, flow into the organization. Now, this backwards or upwards, uh, the point could be the one uh, where the wholesaler is uh, supplying uh, all the, the medicinal uh, supplies to one particular hospital. And this is the point that the hospital, or in other words, the organization may consider buying or uh, the putting up uh, a similar kind of a facility. Uh, the mostly when organizations are uh, resourceful enough, they like to buy existing setups uh, because uh, they get all these systems and procedures installed, only uh, the ownership changes hands and the new owners like to make the existing organization even more efficient and effective. And uh, thereby integrating the whole operation uh, into the supply chain uh, which flows into the organization. So from this particular graphic, I think that this uh, the particular concept is uh, very uh, well clear. Now, if you go further from the organization, which is right in the center, rightwards, that's what you can see from uh, the uh, presentation is the forward area. And the forward area uh, ends up uh, at a box, uh, as you can see from the arrow line, is the forward or downward or downstream area. Now this is where a distributor or a company representative could work fit in. This is where the organization is the distribute, this is where the organization is distributing its program. And this is where it may like to have the certain stakes in the distribution setup in order to make the monitoring and control of the overall uh, distribution situation the more effective. And uh, from there, you go down to the client. Now, the important thing here is that uh, we certainly can draw a relationship here with the earlier slide that we looked at in terms of the depth and breadth of distribution. And uh, this, in other words, can be a representation of uh, one particular line or those particular lines which flow from the primary source which was organization or the supplier and which took us right down to the final consumer. So that is the kind of relationship which this representation has with that particular diagram. Let me further throw some light onto this uh, particular explanation. Um, again, going back to the slide uh, which um, showed us the depth and uh, breadth of distribution. Concentrate on the line which is uh, between the organization and the wholesaler. And that's where the concept of integration fits in. And 
you are with me, I'm sure, the concept of integration in terms of backward integration, because here things are going in a different direction. Wholesaler happens to be upstream, and uh, he's the one who's going to supply uh, the medicines to uh, the hospital, and therefore he's the one, or that organization is the one with which your nonprofit, meaning the hospital, is eyeing to take over. And uh, this is how uh, this particular concept of integration uh, fits into the diagram with which I talked in order to explain the depth and breadth of um, distribution. By the same token, you can draw your own examples and uh, fit those uh, into these two graphical uh, representations in order to have a better clarity of uh, the distribution uh, channels and the concept of uh, backward and forward integration. I would like to have the opportunity here to say once again that uh, the distribution setup basically is the reflection of the market size. It is the size of the market in relation to the product or the program that you are offering that uh, defines the breadth of um, the channel and that breadth of the channel uh, leads toward establishing the depth of the channel, meaning the number of tiers that you have between the organization and the final consumer. And uh, after you are done with uh, all those uh, strategic considerations, uh, you get into the concept of integration, uh, which uh, should be touched upon only if your organization happens to be resourceful enough in terms of human as well as financial resources and it has the ability to absorb the systems and procedures of the organization with which you are eyeing to take over. This is a concept which basically leads organizations towards attaining the more autonomy and the more independence over the supply chain, but they have to make sure that they are going to be more efficient and more effective, thereby with making more profitability and not getting stuck in there. That is the bottom line that we have to keep in mind in terms of integration.